Welcome to today's 3D print. I have these wonderful little gadgets. These are photo viewer downloaders, but I got one big problem. You can't get batteries for them anymore, and all the batteries that exist are 10 years old. Here's how I fix that with 3D printing. So this is the Epson photo viewer um, P7000, Foda, Fine, Premier, whatever you want to call it. Do a search for Epson Photo Storage or Epson Photo Viewer on eBay and you'll find them. Usually pretty cheap because, well, there's one big problem with these things. You can't get these batteries anymore. If you're in the UK, I found a source for like 15 pounds so you can get a battery, which is not that bad. But if you're in the US, so far, the cheapest source I found for these batteries that theoretically might be a source is $153 a pop. I was like, ah, no thank you. <laughs> I was like, I don't want it that bad. <laughs> um, so the way this works is literally you take your compact flash card or your SD card from your camera and you stick it in here like that and you download the contents to the internal hard drive in the device. It's a very clean, smooth, automated process. That's actually a little hard drive. Um, it's a very clean, smooth, automated process. As long as the device is already on, you pop a card in, it recognizes you inserted a card, and says, would you like to back it up? And you just, you, there's no touchscreen. This is predates touchscreens, or well, predates commonality. Uh, believe it or not, you'd prefer not to have a touchscreen on something like this. I would rather just have nice, good, solid buttons. Um, so you would toggle down and click backup CF card or backup SD card. And it would then begin slurping down your memory card to the internal memory. Now, very, very handy as a photographer. I don't need it, per se, because unlike in the past where you had 512 megabyte cards and with today's cameras... I mean, yeah, actually, back then, even that was big. Um, you would actually need to download this card in order to clear off the memory card to allow you to take more pictures. That's no longer really an issue anymore. Unless you're recording, you know, massive RAW files, you're not running out of space. My 32 gigabyte card in my 5DS, which is a 50 megapixel camera, will still hold like 2,800 pictures. <laughs> <laughs> even for a whole week of shooting you're not filling that up too easily but the backup is nice because you now have more than one copy of the pictures so each day uh, of shooting sometimes even midday if I'm back at the car charging I'll plop the memory card in here tell it to slurp down the files and um, this way if something happens to my camera or something happens to the memory card or something gets corrupted or damaged or destroyed I have a backup copy of everything I did since my last backup. And you end up with lots of duplicates because it doesn't do iterative backups, but that's okay. The point is, I don't lose my pictures and I have a, a secondary storage for all my pictures. It's also good for editing, so if you accidentally edit the originals, <laughs> I've done that a couple times, you can go and restore your originals from your, your off-site, basically, meaning it's off your PC backup. It's not the fastest thing in the world, but it's not bad. Um, 32 megabits per second is your download speed, USB 2.0 connection on the side here. Now, the problem, though, is the battery, because it's really only convenient if it can make it battery-powered. I can already charge the unit by USB. It's a, basically a PSP plug. Actually, the, the typical PSP power wire you get is pretty handy, because it's got the mini-A and the um, barrel plug of the right size. So you can charge it and power it. At the same time, of course, of course that would happen. Well, why would it happen at any other time during the day except then? <laughs> so anyway, I needed to replace this battery, and I was trying to figure out a way to do that, and somebody on Reddit, um, One-Eyed Plankton, said that's almost certainly an 18650 cell, and I was like, I cannot believe I'm that stupid. Of course, it's an 18650 cell. <laughs> that's exactly what's in there. It's an 18650 cell. <laughs> So basically, it's an 18650 cell wrapped in a package. At first, that annoyed me, but then he made a very good point. Un naked 18650 cells are dangerous. You short this cell out, it blows up. So um, it makes sense for a consumer device where the consumer is going to be handling the batteries to have the battery wrapped in some kind of a, a shell that will prevent it from easily being shorted or create havoc. 
Now, I can't do anything with the center pin, and apparently that center pin's important because I can't charge my battery in the device, because you see where we're going with this. I made my own battery, and I made my own parts. So here's all the iterations that I've been through. At first, I tried to make a complete shell. This used to be closed, but I had a problem with it. Um, it is a pain in the butt, and I even had a little, little closable end cap here. So you can actually close that. Let me give you a better view. There we go. Um, but it would close that and give you... I need dimmer. There we go. Um, and that actually worked. You know, the resin printer allows you to do that. So this would close off the end of it once you were done. And I figured I would just a couple drops of glue to seal it up. It turns out it was a whole lot easier to just make do away with that altogether and just make it an open top carrier. And I eventually devolved down to what you see on the screen here, and that is this right here. So this is my final cleaned up version. You buy a little roll of nickel strip, it was like 10 bucks or less, it was less than that I think. And I designed it for the four millimeter strip. So one loop would wrap around there. There's actually slots in the end of the print, you see the slots there? All those are the slots where you feed the nickel strip. And then the nickel strip actually slides in through this here. And then it's inside this cavity. You can actually see it inside there. See it? You can actually see the strips underneath that protective platform there. The last change I made was to add this channel. See this channel here? So that you can see the, po I made the positive strip longer on this side just so you can see what I'm talking about. So if the positive strip ends up being long enough where it can move around, it can't come over here and say hello to the negative strip, which would give you a really bad day. So this is the appropriate shape, and these metal contacts are in the appropriate spot so that when you put an 18650 cell in here, you now have a battery pack. And that battery pack, I actually haven't tried it in this one yet. This is a P2000. Yeah, I do have a sidewall here, so that should be okay, because it has to engage this to hold it in. But that fits in there and makes contact. I think this battery's dead, but yeah, it'll turn on for a second. There you go. Oh, I forgot the hard drive in this one's bad. But there you go, it turns on with my little custom battery pack in there. That's another unit that I got with a bad hard drive. They refunded my money. I'm going to try to get another one with a good hard drive. Then I can clone the hard drive and I can make that one work again. Maybe. We'll see. But there you go. It's that simple. Well, it wasn't that simple. It was about 100 hours in Tinkercad. You know, iteration after iteration. You know, tweak it, try it, tweak it, try it. Um, you can see I, I hacked this one all up as I figured out, okay, let's get rid of the side. Make it easier to deal with. Moving this because the metal strip wasn't as flexible as I thought. Adjusting the thickness of the channels to make them more reliable when it printed. You know, it needed this this little right angle edge here. I guess so you can't put it in backwards. Uh, this one here is closed off on the end, but I didn't have to duplicate that. There was no reason to. Not this way. So I, I there was no reason for me to add that. And the nice thing about 3D printing is that things that are required for making a mold, you don't have to do yourself as long as it matches up. My paths here are a little wider to make um, use of the off-the-shelf nickel strips that I was able to buy. So this is enough to do dozens and dozens and dozens of batteries because you really don't need that much. I believe this is a temperature probe. We, we don't know if this is a temperature probe or what. But what I do know is that when I put this in the unit, it runs fine, but it won't charge. So when I put this... When I put a good battery in here, well, this is not a good battery, but an original battery. When I put an original battery in here and plug it in, you can see a green light turns on to indicate that it is charging. I thought green light meant done charging, but I believe that is not the case. When I put mine in, however...
this doesn't indicate charging at all so that indicates nothing when I plug it in now isn't that interesting the older one doesn't indicate a thing the new one however I guess is more advanced this is one this is the second generation of this unit the P2000 this is the seventh generation the latest model is available the P7000 um, if we pop my battery in it is red so normally orange indicates charging orange red indicates charging but in this case I believe that indicates error because it eventually depleted the battery so it wasn't actually charging the battery and I believe that is because I don't have that third terminal so when I put a original battery in there it shows up green so I believe green is charging which indicates to me that it is actually doing something with that third terminal and there is actually an electrical contactor inside the unit can probably show you yeah you can see it see how it's got three blades sticking up there so it is actually doing something that spring is just to push the battery out when you release this but you can see there's three blades down in there so it is actually doing something with that third contact the problem is the only way for me to figure that out is to take one of these apart and I refuse to do that because I can't get any more of these batteries so until I come across one of these until I have enough of these batteries that I'm willing to take one apart I only have two and until um, or if I come across one that's bad meaning it doesn't hold the charge really then I'd be willing to take it apart because there is no way to non-destructively take apart this battery. And this is um, sonically sealed. That looks like a see how it's shiny. See how it's shiny along that edge. That usually means sonic welding. You know they have a tool that zzz, and these plastic parts are basically welded together. So there is no non-destructive way of taking this apart. So I don't want to do it. <laughs> probably what I'll end up doing is cutting the end off chipping away at it until I find out where the battery is then cut the end off and once I have the end off I'll be able to go up each side with a knife and then basically take the canopy off basically turn it into one of these so you see here except it'll also be missing the back I'd like to try to do it without taking it apart I can always glue a new back on because then I could reuse this casing but I'd like to find out what that circuitry is and what I'd like to do is, I plan to take these units apart to put a solid state hard drive in them, because right now they have spinners. Um, put a solid state hard drive in it, put a terabyte hard drive in there. And then um, take this circuitry and permanently install it into the device itself. So make whatever this circuit is, if it's a thermocouple, make that part of the device instead of part of the battery. This way, my universal batteries will work, and this thing will still do its job. If it's a thermocouple, as long as I have that thermocouple touching the battery, so I could very easily just put that thermocouple you know, along this wall here so that it would still be near the battery. This way, if the battery, I'm assuming if the battery overheats or if the battery's too cold, it tells the unit to do something. Um... And then my universal batteries will work with the device and still have that safety protocol in place. Or it's possible it's actually getting data from this. Like there's a BMS in here and there's actually data coming over. Like it's using like the common ground and this to transfer data between the device. So it's possible these are unprotected batteries, meaning there's no BMS in here. It's possible the BMS is in the device and it needs this channel to talk to it. I don't know. I won't know that until I take it apart. But as you can see on the screen here, here's how I made it in Tinkercad. I started off just by making a rough approximation of the outside shape of the battery. And then I started making the appropriate customizations that allow me to 3D print it and use it. You might notice, those who are more familiar with this stuff might notice that the battery looks a little strange. The battery, if you look out here, you can see it too. You might notice it's not the same shape as the original battery. This has got two parallel walls that are perpendicular to this wall, while this does not. And that is because this entire thing is angled. 
So this is actually supposed to be, I think it's four degrees. Oh, yeah, yeah four, four degrees, five degrees. So I tilted the whole thing five degrees. And then lopped off the bottom. There was just enough space there to allow me to have structural integrity here and have the base angled. The reason I did that was because this is a huge open air bridge. And that was actually causing me significant problems printing it. This kept collapsing. It's part of the reason why the full coverage one kept collapsing on me, where I would slide the battery in through the end. Um, and that's because it's, it's, it's an open air bridge. Once I successfully got one working, I realized I had a little bit more tolerance available to me. So I was able to thicken up some parts of it. So like this part here is now a little thicker like this one. You can see how this looks a lot better. And while this one looks pretty beat up, that's because it's, it's very flexible. So the, um, once I realized I have more tolerance available to me, I was able to thicken it up a little bit, thicken up this wall a little bit. Um, shorten it enough so the battery just pops right in and then I found out that the holes they have to be at least 0.5 millimeters thick or there's a 50-50 shot they close up when it's printed now that probably comes down to exposure if I were to reduce my exposure I could probably make thinner holes that would not close up but I prefer the stability of longer exposures so I made a hole bigger uh, so these are all 0.5 and the it just slides right in there. You can see it's actually sliding inside. So this is an angle cut. Actually, it's going this way into the model. And the trick was to just optimize this entire design for 3D printing. So by printing at a slight angle like that, I basically got the same effect as resin print guys get when they lift the model up on supports and angle it. Well, I got that same effect. You can actually even see the ribbing see it that's the layers that's the 0.05 layers because there actually is a stair step because it's not flat it's it's angled and that stair stepping allowed it to build up from here out instead of all at once which is why it was failing because this part would be soft and only be 0.05 thick and it would just collapse especially with the FEP forces pushing on it and it would just it just mangled it so this as you can see printed pretty much perfectly um, so the way that works is I stick the um, the metal strip through here and then I fold it over top of itself and pull it back through you see this part here is the excess on top there I just fold it flat there's no electrical contacts inside there, although you could put a, a sticker over there if you wanted to. I didn't feel the need to. You come down here, do a 90 degree fold, come down here, wrap around the bottom. I had it set to go in here and then back out again. You'll see that on here, I have a, a double hole. The idea was it would, um, it would go in this hole and then come back out this hole and then go up and make the bend. That would make this crease very tight like you see on here. You see how this one is nice and tight. But I found out it just wasn't necessary, and it was just too difficult to get the metal to behave properly. The, the, once the metal bends, it wants to hold that shape. It doesn't stay flexible like a ribbon. And that, by the, if you could force it, but then you just break the part. So I just went straight up. And um, what I'm, hmm, what I might do is put a slot this way with a little bridge over here um, and then this whole piece we could just slide the metal in there that might work that might work but so far it's not necessary this stays put it doesn't move once this is all bent and pushed into place and you've formed these creases this does not move so there's no need to do it this then slides up underneath here where's it at right there and you can see it in there this one actually goes too far it comes all the way down to the end here that's that one right there that's what this channel is for and that divider in the middle is for is to make sure the positives can't hug the negatives the wrong way now the negative terminal I simply um, the negative terminal is in here twice so there's actually two pieces of the negative terminal in there and so I slide it into 
this way into here, and it's part way under there. Oop, it's part way under there. And then the other half slides into here all the way down. And then I fish it out up here. I give it a little crease there at the bottom. You can see there, a little crease. And then I just wad up the end of the negative. Now, if I wanted to be neat, I could, you know, put a little drop of glue there. But I've so far found it's just not necessary. You know, once you have this in here, it ain't going nowhere. So you just push it back into place just like that. And it works fine. No problems. Let me show you that again. So you just touch it there push it into place and if you want to be secure a single piece of masking tape around here you know make sure this is pushed in um, I can even put a little groove there to make it easier to put masking tape but so far I haven't needed it this seems to work just fine once it's inside the machine it's not going anywhere this also means I can slide this out and just pop out a battery pop in a fresh battery and stick it back in the machine so it makes battery swapping almost as convenient as the OEM battery and you only need one of these. Um, but I'm probably going to make these semi-permanent once I figure out this circuit. If I don't figure out that circuit, I'll just keep a couple extra 18650s in my bag. And then all I have to do is pop out an 18650 and pop in an 18650 and keep on going. Um, that also means I could use unprotected cells. So I can use 3,000 milliamp cells. 3,200 milliamp cells. Because you have a little more space. These are high output 2,500s. I use these for my... Um, my big old flashlight. I have these, I have these really powerful flashlights I used to use for pizza delivery. They could focus the beam down real tight so I could light up house numbers without shining a flashlight into people's windows. But yeah, that worked great. I had, I love it. I'm thrilled. I'm absolutely thrilled this worked. This, this might work FDM printed. It's now beefy enough that in theory this might survive FDM printing, especially if I made this a 45 degree. Because you'd have to either print it on its side or print it like this. Um, the only problem is I don't think these slots would work unless I made them significantly thicker. But it might. So I might try that. I might try to thicken up these slots so that this can be FDM printed. Because, you know, with this being constrained the way it is inside of a shell, it, it doesn't matter if it gets a little warm in your car. It's not going to go anywhere because the plastic has nowhere to go. So this might work as an FDM print. So I may try that, maybe. We'll see. But I had another battery I had to do. I got an old film camera. And if you know anything about these old film cameras, they take those weird batteries. Remember those? These things here? The two CR5s. They're one-time use lithium batteries. Basically, it has two of these inside, CR123s. I don't know if I might even say it. They're just Energizer photo batteries, but they're basically 123s. And so I started this one. This is for the CR5. I tried FDM printing it, didn't work so well. Um, with the new, I even in resin printing, I had a problem with peeling. You can see it was peeling up on this on this corner here which distorted, I don't know why it's got holes in it, that's weird, it's got like aeration holes in it. Must have been an air bubble in the resin. But, um, these are a little harder to make, but easier to wire up, big time. So I added these little, basically brim tabs, these little tabs here, to make sure it could build these curves without a problem. It's like trying to print the bottom of a sphere, it's really hard to do, because you don't get proper cooling in there. And then one on the, you know, and this one was important, because you have a hole that goes through here. This one was less important, so I just put a single tab. And you just, when you're done, you just take your nippers and just snip the tabs off. <laughs> Super easy. So this might now be FDM printable. I may have to try that. Probably, again, have to beef up the holes. And I came up with this. I do need one more iteration. But this worked well. And super, super easy to put together, too. Because this strip just passes straight through here. Oop, you can't see that. This strip just passes straight through, comes out both sides. And because these are rigid, once you bend them into shape, I put two holes in the back here. And I just shove it into the hole. I, I literally, I just take my tool, and I just shove it into the hole so it forms to that shape. And there you go. That holds it in just fine. These up here literally just wrap around. 
So it goes through that hole. I put it through. I start here, go through the hole, wrap fully around, and go through the hole again. And then I snip off the excess right there. You can see the end of the excess right there. You can see the very end of it, that little shiny edge you can see there. That's it. There's no glue or anything. Um, this side has a bump out to make sure the negative can actually touch because otherwise this might not touch it if it sits inside of a channel because you need the channel to keep it from moving. Um, so the negatives get a bump out to make sure that they actually touch and the positives don't. They just have a channel for it to slide into and it just pops in just like that. And that is it. It just pops right in just like that. This one I actually modified to add a channel because what would happen is the button would catch the edge of this. After that, it was just a matter of scaling it until this properly fit. Matter of fact, the only problem I have with this one is I have to put a little tiny piece of paper on top of it so that the door, the battery door, pushes down just hard enough for it to make contact. For some reason, just sitting there isn't enough. It actually has to be pushed into the contacts. So in the next iteration, I'm going to add a little tiny bump on top of here. And that, that little tiny bump, probably one millimeter thick, should be enough so that when this little bump hits that little bump, it pushes the battery in to make the contact. Because right now, if I just put this in here and close it, we get nothing. But if I push up on it, you can see we get something. See? So now, this one, I just put this little piece of paper in there, and that's enough for it to make contact and work. And now I have a working camera. I think the batteries are a little too high voltage, because at first when I was running this, it would get stuck running over and over and over again, like that, where it would take multiple exposures. And I think that's because the battery voltage on this is about 8 volts with those two cells while the original photolithium was 6 volts and I think that was just enough to piss it off so maybe I'll I don't know maybe I'll put a resistor in here to drop the voltage a little bit I don't know if I can do that or not I don't know how easy that is or just don't worry about it just deplete the battery a little bit before you put them in <laughs> it seems like as soon as it drops by about half a volt the camera starts behaving properly or it's possible that camera is just messed up that's entirely possible um, but yeah, this worked fantastically. The holes printed nicely, so I may try FDM printing this. But that came out really, really nice. Both of these are on Thingiverse, so if you have a device, if you have an Epson device that needs um, this battery, it's the, it's the EU97 or the D111A. So if your device, you have an Epson reader or an Epson device that needs this battery, there's also other devices that use a similar battery to this. So it wouldn't be that hard to modify the file to accommodate changes. So for example, JVC had a battery that was also like this, but it had two round pilot hole pins inside there. That should be relatively easy to accommodate. Um, yeah, this 3D printing allows us to salvage old, totally useful technology that's still a great thing to have and a great thing to use without having to throw it away just because you can't get a battery for it anymore or because you don't want to you know waste you know nine dollars a pop or six dollars a pop on these freaking disposable photo lithium batteries when you've got a bunch of these rechargeable ones lying around already well now you just get some nickel strip which you'll be able to use for years and you have a 3d printer already now you can just make up yourself a little battery holder and use your little rechargeable batteries very very cool i like it a lot i mean these rechargeable batteries cost more than this cost i think i paid 12 bucks but i got six of these plus charger or four of them plus charger because another film camera i have needed two of these separately um well the very second time you have to buy one of these it paid for itself <laughs> and it also means i can use the same batteries across different cameras now so if the camera needs just um, these um, cells here and I just use those cells there and when the camera needs a 2CR5 I just put them together into a 2CR5 and now I have a 2CR5 and I could probably do that with other things too but that is the magic of 3D printing even something as simple as Tinkercad 
will allow you to do crazy awesome things like this. Like here we can make that little modification right now. That's that side. That's this side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the work plane on here. I'm going to grab a little hump, put it right there. Then we're going to hold down the shift key to change all three dimensions at once. And all we want to do is put a little bump right there. That's it. Just let's integrate it so that it's strong. Might as well center it. There's no reason not to. That might be too tall. I'm going to shorten that just a hair. There you go. Now I've integrated a little bump into the model. I don't care about this overhang. That'll print just fine. Um, we, we, that overhang is 0.3 millimeters. It's just not going to matter. It'll print just fine. Um, but that should be enough to allow the little thing inside here to push down on the battery without me having to stick a little piece of paper in there. And a resin print for this costs nothing. So I'm not really worried about the cost if I have to iterate this one or two more times. And in the meantime, if it's not enough, I can still continue to use them. I'll just have to put a little piece of paper in there. Or drop a glue, dry it, drop a glue, dry it until you build it up high enough. But once you figure out the right height, then every one you print from then on will be fine. I'll also try FDM printing this. I think I'll thicken up these holes a little bit for the FDM version to make sure they'll actually print and go from there. But yeah, that's cool. I mean, I was able to revive these. Now, so now i got to worry about the price of these things going up now. <laughs> Once people realize, oh, I can get batteries for this? Yeah, watch these things start going for two or $300 again. <laughs> Wouldn't that be epic? I, I make it practical to use them by developing a battery pack for them, and now the price skyrockets because, oh, we can get batteries again. <laughs> that would suck. But hey, it is what it is. So if you have any questions, ask down below. I'd be thrilled to answer them. And I will see you guys later. And remember, don't throw them gadgets away. Try to save them. That's that's part of the magic of 3D printing is being able to do stuff like this. It only took me like two nights of iterating and printing. And I now have working batteries. Like this one's a good one. This one's a good one. Uh, this one I've started working on. So you, see how, you can see how it slides in there. And then it slides underneath here. You can probably see it moving around. Yeah, there it is. See it? It's in there and it pops out the other end. There it is. <laughs> so yeah, that works surprisingly well. I was very happy with how well that worked. But now I have, you know, I have enough parts to make three more of these batteries because these are all, all three of these are good. Four. I have enough parts to make four batteries. So that makes me a happy critter. You guys have a great day.